Welcome everyone to a live episode of Leveraging AI, the podcast that shares practical, ethical ways to grow your business, advance your career. And we are here today to talk about AI implementation. And AI implementation today has a very interesting dissonance in it. On one hand, you have a lot of people who are using it daily across multiple things, whether in their businesses, in education, on their personal lives. But from an organizational perspective, there's a huge gap as far as how to actually implement AI in an efficient way through the organization in a way that's going to be A, effective, and B, safe. I literally had two conversations in the last 24 hours with two potential clients that told me, yeah, we got started. We set up this group that are like the AI experts of the company, but they know really know what to do and they're not making any progress and everybody's really frustrated and this is happening and they're actually a few steps ahead because they've actually set up a committee to do these kind of things our guest today amanda birkstaff bickerstaff is an expert on exactly that topic she is the founder and ceo of ai for education and she's been helping educational organizations understand how this whole ai thing works and how to implement it in a way that everybody will benefit from, right? So the educators, as well as the students, and everybody in the organization. And the conversation is going to be not just about education, even though we're going to focus a lot about that, but on an organization in general. How should an organization approach the implementation of AI in a way that will be, as I said, effective and safe? So I'm really excited. I know a lot of people are struggling with this right now. And so, Amanda, I want to welcome you to Leveraging AI. Welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here today. Like I said, I'm Amanda, I'm the co-founder and CEO of AI for Education, and this is our world. We are fully focused on the, re the responsible adoption of generative AI specifically in educational institutions, whether that's from the school level, the district, leadership, higher ed, but also working more and more with uh, companies. So education companies, tech companies. And so it, it's been really interesting. Just had a good conversation today about thinking through like how you even think about using generative AI to support content development and how do you start to create some infrastructure for these tools? So happy to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. I want to thank, first of all, those who have joined us on the chat. So feel free to, on the Zoom, feel free to write in the chat who you are, where you're from, what you're looking to get out of this. And for those of you who are hopefully watching us on LinkedIn live, thank you as well for joining us. We're doing this almost every Thursday. So Thursday noon Eastern time, we're doing these lives with experts like Amanda talking about AI practical implementation. So if you want to join us, just follow me on LinkedIn. There's always like a place to sign up. And if you're in the Zoom, then you can absolutely ask questions and we will try to relate to those as we move forward. So Amanda, let's really dive in and get started. What is the problem? right? It doesn't sound like such a big deal on paper, right? It's a new technology. We had new technologies before. We've been through change processes through organizations before. Like it's not the first time this is happening. And yet literally across the board, people are struggling to deal with this and to understand how to move forward in, in a way that makes sense. Can you help us understand why there's such a big of a problem talking to so many organizations and helping them through the process? Sure. I think that while artificial intelligence has been around since the 50s, and we have been a few, 84% of everyone daily uses some form of artificial intelligence. If you have one of these, 77% of your apps, like your interactions will have something to do with artificial intelligence. If you've got your computer, if you're a big social media fan, or you're actually working with an organization that already has your own machine learning models. So we have had artificial intelligence part of our lives for a really long time, but ways that are not consumer facing. Like we don't, it doesn't say TikTok powered by AI algorithms. Like that isn't something that happened, even though it absolutely is. It's going to get you to watch that cat video and learn about you every single time you interact with that technology. And so it's been this kind of underlying technology that has become a part of our lives and it has driven a lot of technology development. And what we see is that there was the first like generative AI that kind of hit the scene was IBM Watson. I don't know if anybody is a Jeopardy fan in the audience. That's almost a decade ago. And it did something pretty well. It beat Jeopardy, right? But it wasn't like making up new Jeopardy questions and answering and playing as three people. What we're seeing is being more possible with generative AI. And it took quite a bit of time. And 
what ended up happening is we had this like move towards more like deep learning and looking at how the brain works and creating these artificial neural networks, like a transformer model, which is the underpinning technology for chat GPT. Um, and so there's a lot of development that happens between like 2018 and 2022 that allows us to see this really complex processing possible for the first time. And it shifts the way that we think about like technology and but really, the reason why we're talking about this today is that OpenAI decided to put an experimental conversational AI tool into the world as an experiment and said, here you go. And November 2022, ChatGPT 3.5 coming out like a couple months later, and then we had four coming out in March. And what happened is the world became OpenAI's guinea pig. And we we say, if it's free, you're the product, but that's what happened. And But the thing is that this technology is like unlike anything that has come before it. If you've used a Siri and predictive text and a terrible chatbot online that you can never get to a representative, that is not a step change from ChatGPT. We're talking like this is a magnitude change in terms of capabilities, interaction, et cetera. And what happens is you have this acceleration that happens so quickly. And what we see is that the if you look at Facebook hitting 100 million users, it takes about a decade. Even TikTok, everyone loves TikTok, it takes nine months. Even Threads, which was like just Instagram, took months. ChatGPT took five weeks. And so suddenly you have this massive new technology that is consumer facing in a way that has never happened before. It took a decades for the internet to impact our lives. It took the quantum of weeks, days for ChatGPT. And that's why we're in this position today, just about a year and change later, is that this is transformative, but also consumer facing in a way that's never been seen before. I love the way you framed it. I When I talk to you, and um, when I do this on stages and I talk about this topic, there's two things that are very different about this than any other transformational change we had in history. And there've been a few, right? You, you had multiple steps in history, but these steps get closer, like shorter and shorter in time. And as you mentioned, now it's within weeks and things are changing regularly. But the other thing is how wide it is, right? So the number of use cases this solves. So if you think about the agriculture change that we had, I don't know if you, okay, people built a tractor. So now a farmer could farm a lot more land with one person, but that's all it could do. It could go through his field. Then the internet came. In the beginning, it didn't do almost anything. Like the early days of the internet, you had a browser. It was very lame. There was like landing pages like Yahoo. They could get information. That's all it did. And it was like this for a few years. And now we have a tool that can do so many things across what seems to be an endless number of use cases. And new tools and new use cases are born every single day. And I think... And the speed. And I think the combination of these two things, like how wide it is and how fast it's happening, is what's overwhelming organizations. So now that we've framed the problem, what is the solution? Like how should, I'm a manager, a leader, a CEO, a head of school, doesn't matter what I am. I'm in charge of the success of the organization that I'm running. What do I need to do? Or maybe people underneath me, like what other people, I'm just a nobody in a, in a large organization. What can I do? What's the right approach in order to actually start having a structured implementation of this thing? The best thing I can say is that let's not throw out, you know, the things that work. And there's a change management process. If you're an organizational leader, and I see a couple here, then please do not think that this is somehow something so special that like we can't go through a change management process. When we think about change management, we're thinking about creating a couple of things. One is creating a common understanding of what we are talking about and what actually needs to change. And I think that's the most important first step is that because this technology is unlike anything that's come before it and is essentially you as an actor are going to be interacting directly with a computer interface, meaning like it's not, you are now a programmer if you're using generative AI and you're using ChatGPT or others, right? That it's really important to think about that, that part of this is just learning what this technology is and isn't. So for example, if I ask a room of a thousand people, if you used it or not used it, there'll be a wide variance. It was still in a very early adopter space. More and more people are using it for their own work, their productivity. Some of them are using it and not saying it because they don't know if it's appropriate or if guidelines will be changed. But we have a lot of people that have some deep insignificant misconceptions 
around things like thinking versus computing. Are these tools thinking? Is this like Skynet? Or is this like data from, or Janet from The Good Place, like when I recently heard. But I think that there's some big misconceptions, but some of this is just taking the time to learn. So if you look at Slack, for example, Slack took a week off a week off to just focus on, they say AI, but really generative, right? And what does this mean for the organization, both internally and externally? So this is a moment where this cannot be another thing. Like when we talk about change management, you commit to a process and you know it's big enough. I promise you right now, if you have not committed to a process around adopting generative AI, you need to today or tomorrow or in a week. And the reason why I say that is because this is not only is it not going away, but it will be deeply embedded in almost every part of our lives over the next 36 months. Google Maps will have a button that tells you where to go to dinner because you're like, you're fighting with your, your friends about who no one can decide. Google Maps will use generative AI to help you do that. So we're going to see it in this very deep way. And so I think that there is something you said about the change management process. So building that base of understanding, spending some time, making it a priority, and then starting to identify use cases in which you have a problem that can be uniquely solved by generative AI. So it's not like, it's like I love that you said something about is this idea that it can do so many things and it absolutely can. And so this is where it's going to get really interesting is that this does have multiple applications, but it is not an end-all solution. It is something that needs to have a lot of different thought and approaches. And it needs to be something that is, we need, you need to understand what your problem is and then look for a solution. And that's where a lot of people are living right now. And then it's time, like once you've done that and started identifying these use cases and, I, and looking at the ways in which you can potentially increase productivity for your team, you can create better experiences for your, your customers through better interactions, whatever it may be. The next stage is like innovation. What are you actually going to do to start bringing these technologies to drive real change in your organization? Because there is a technology that can do things that have never been done before. The only thing is like, you can't start there because you don't know enough about it to know what it's possible. Most likely you have to build towards that space. I agree. I Two points. One, I want to summarize two of the key things that you said. The first thing is awareness and education, right? You need... You said that Slack stopped everything for a week. That's Think about it. It's a pretty big company and they've stopped everybody to do this. So you need to make it clear for everyone that this process is happening, right? We are going to work on AI. We're going to work on understanding it. You need to lay out what your process is going to be. And we're going to talk about this in a second. So this is step one. And something that I want to add to that actually Bob in the chat related to, it's not a one-time thing. I, when I teach my clients or when I teach on stages or my courses, it's the number one thing that I tell people is continuous education. Like this thing is constantly evolving. Now, an organization, especially a large organization, cannot change every day or every week. They just cannot. But you need somebody or a few people that are actually are paying attention, that are going to filter the stuff that actually makes a difference, that going back to what you said as the second thing, figure out where can this provide value easily and with low risk? Because then you can get quick wins. You can get people to start using it. You can get people to start understanding what this thing can do. And then, okay, then you go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So having this mindset of this is going to be continuously evolving and we need to create a process that will allow us to evolve with it so we can benefit from it is the right way to do this. What are the practical steps or mindset that you help your clients define in order to do this effectively? Yeah, the first thing is let's create a space and where we have some time to, to learn and explore together. Let's actually set aside with an expert. It doesn't have to be internal. Someone that's good about it, like understanding the technology and can explain it in ways in which you can understand it. But let's experiment. Let's hang out. Let's try. This. These tools are fascinating. And they could be super weird and super funny and super, oh my goodness, like this is something that I didn't know was possible. But the thing is, this is not, if I go into my staff room and say, hey, everybody, generative AI is going to change the game and it can do all these things. Until you use it, until you see it, until you have the visceral reaction of doing it and seeing what's possible, it's very difficult to have that person's thing, say that thing, and then it be real to you. Because like, how you mean it could do an entire front end of a website with like in 45 seconds now? 
No, that you can talk about it, but until you show it, and of course it's not going to be perfect, but my goodness, what is that going to change for us? Or it can give me a pretty decent, like a GPT-4 class model can give me a pretty decent starting place for a quick response to customer feedback or qualitative feedback. And it's not going to be perfect, but maybe like it just helps me to bounce that idea off and does it in a minute or less. And I think that's where there's just a really strong opportunity to have some dedicated time with the right supports in a scaffolded way to just get in there and start using this. So the one of the ways that we do this with schools and as education institutions, so we have a we have our prompt library. And our prompt library, our prompts. So when you interact with ChatGPT or other tools, you're prompting. You're, that's the way that we call the interaction, the questions that you ask. And while it's not like a computer program in the traditional sense where you create a prompt and it's always going to work, there are some best practices and some really good use cases that are commonly used. Like that email that from a customer that you don't want to answer because you're afraid you might be a little bit snarky or not have the headspace or whatever may have you. I'm not using any personal identifying information, you can use a prompt pretty reliably to help you with refining a response or at least getting some talking points. And so I think that's something that we see. So you can collect and create that for your own team. Like maybe there are 10 really good use cases for productivity that you feel confident in that will really help drive some use, usability, some productivity, feel good, do it in a safe and responsible way. So you're using it in the way that your people aren't creating uneth unethical moments where they or practices that they not realize potentially and just get in there. And I think that, that we skip over that as part with something new. Or if we even bring in a new technology, we don't have that time where you can get to play around a demo. And sometimes like something like a new C a, a new CRM is not going to be very fun to play around with. A GPT-4 class model, right? Now potentially Gemini Ultra and are advanced and now GPT-4. It's a really good time. And so I think that's where we say is the first step is just giving that time to explore, have it be scaffolded, start to build some internal knowledge. And then when you go forward, you're talking from a space of shared understanding of common experience. And that is going to allow that next step to be a lot easier. So I love what you're saying on two aspects. One is the fact that if you don't experiment with this, you don't understand what it can do. And it's going back to what you said. It's the first time in history that a really highly capable software came with zero instructions. Yeah. There is no user manual. There is no blog it that tells you how to use it. Okay, it's okay, go figure it out. I'm like, what do you mean go figure it out? Tell me how to use this thing. No, it doesn't exist. And the way to know how to use this thing is to follow the right people, see what they're doing, experiment yourself and figure it out. And so that's one thing that you said that I really like. The other thing that I love that I actually don't say a lot, but I think it's a very good idea is give people a solid starting point. If you don't, if you give people a blank sheet of paper, it's very hard, but I say, okay, here are 10 prompts that you can use to do either this or that. Now they're like, oh, okay. Now I understand how I can use this in the context of a specific use case. And I can see what it's doing. And it's not a black box. I'm not clicking a button. I can actually see what's written. And they're like, oh, what if I change this? What if I do that? Which is what you call like a experimenting. Like you can then play with it. So I think giving people, like you said, a safe space, a good starting point, and a few use cases they can start using that you spoon feed them, right? It's not go figure it out. It's okay, here are stuff that we, quote unquote, the organization, figure out that you can already start using. I have an interesting follow-up question to that. Who in the organization creates these initial use cases and prompts and based on what? So I would say that there are probably some people in your organization already that are early adopters. These are the people that are like, it came out in the playground even before November and they're like, oh my goodness, or the person that used it for the first time last spring and it changed their lives. And they use it all the time and they're really encouraged by it. They're engaged, they read, they understand. I would tap those people with potentially someone within your organization that's focused on operations, someone that's focused on those kind of day of the day tasks, because these productivity gains are that great low risk entry point, right? Like where are the places in which we can help our team do something that is going to increase the quality of their work and is going to allow for it to be done in a more efficient manner and or to extend their work in terms of a creative partner, a brainstorming partner, whatever may have you. 
And so I think that what you do is you you already, I promise you, you, you might, it might, might be someone you know, but there is someone within your organization or many people in your organization that would love the opportunity to do this in a productive way. But make sure that you're now combining them with someone that's going to know that first of all, they're going to take into account the ethics and the protections of your organization. For example, the ChatGPT is considered to be a leaky it's a leaky model, meaning that sometimes the things that you think are private will randomly show up in someone's chat box in China. Like it doesn't happen. Like it happens very small, but it can happen. There's also been experiences in which someone has entered something that is international intellectual property that has now been something that was shared with someone else. And there are things like that. There are also questions around your privacy. If you're working with different organizations, you'll have different privacy components about identifiable information, et cetera. So you want to make sure that you're having that ethical consideration, as well as knowing that these models do not think they are probabilistic models and they make stuff up. Literally, that's how they work is they are always making stuff up. And sometimes those made up things are wrong and that's called a hallucination. So you want to make sure that you have those kind of considerations and then do it. And then that's a great place though, because you're not asking your operations or your, your compliance people, or your cybersecurity people to do that on their own, but you're now partnering with those really excited people that are going to bring the energy that are going to be able to help you do that. And that would be my suggestion. Another suggestion that we see that's really interesting is that especially you have a risk or a change of uh, averse group that you work with in one area, bring someone in that's an expert for that time too, to help you start figuring out those use cases. Because what will also happen is we see this all the time. Sometimes like you do have those early doctors, but this doesn't, they're just not being listened to because how does Terry from HR suddenly an AI expert, right? And so I think that there's an opportunity also to think about if you do know this is a big barrier or you don't feel that confident, then bringing in an organization or a partner or to do that work with you is a great way to get started and accelerate that too. You don't always have to do it on, at your, on your own. No, I agree with you hundred percent. I tell people, and that's what I do with my clients is first of all, let's build a committee and the committee is aligned a lot with what you're saying. You preferably want a person from each department. So in schools, it will be different than in a company, but in a company, it would be somebody from HR, somebody from finance, somebody from operations, somebody from sales, somebody from marketing. Why? Because A, they will have different needs. B, then you'll have a champion in each of the departments that will help you do it. But the other thing that I tell people is you want the people who are geeks you want the people that will actually spend 9 p.m. to midnight playing with this thing because they find it fun and cool and exciting because then they will give you solutions that otherwise will be work for people. And this is, oh my God, this is like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I can do this and I can do that. Then they're going to experiment and they're going to do the thing. But the other thing that you touched on, I think is very important. And that's to me, the number one thing that committee needs to do as far as education is really tell people what are the boundaries, the do's and don'ts of when you should what you shouldn't, what you can do, what you cannot do, because people don't know. Like a lot of people don't know that the data you uploaded to it can be used for training of the model in some scenarios. People don't know that it makes stuff up completely in the same, by the way, in the same level of confidence as the correct answers. And sometimes we will mix the two together and some of it will be correct and some of it will be completely made up. And so the education, and if I make it even more extreme to a sales organization, uh, salespeople, are driven by results because they get paid commissions as a big part of their salaries. They might push the limits of what's acceptable or not acceptable from your organization's core values. Like I'm not willing to do this and that in order to get additional sales, but some people now have tools to do stuff that they were not able to do before. You can literally create stuff out of thin air that looks completely real, whether it's reports, images, videos, testimonials, anything you want. And to most organizations, that would be unacceptable to manipulate your clients in order to buy from you. But these things have to be defined by a group of people that are in charge of doing this. The other thing that it does, going back to your point, is now Terry from HR, everybody knows she's a part of the HR committee. So by definition, they're going to listen to her and follow what she says and so on, because there's going to be a buy-in from the leadership team that has defined this committee. So it's a great way to do what you suggested. And I think that to Matt's point in the channel, if you're a school or you're like an early doctor somewhere and no one's listening to you, 
don't feel alone. That's happening. We often think about these moments in time that it's it's my industry, my company is being slow or too risk averse or think this is going to go away. It's not your industry. It's not your company. It is happening all across. This is a unifying moment in time where we have the same level of confusion, concern, excitement, fear, like completely and totally no idea how to get started happening across everything from medicine to sales to tech itself. I promise you that is true to schools. And I think that this is an opportunity, though, to recognize to everyone here is that this is so early still. And there's this like, this axiom or this kind of thing that like you're either too early or too late for technology. And it might feel like you're already too late, but I promise you, you are not. Because these models, not only are they incredibly unreliable in some ways, especially to be used in a consistent manner, but they are also extremely expensive. The processing and compute costs of these tools are, can get incredibly expensive, especially if you're using the highest class model. And so while it might sound great, right now, you will see sales earning calls at Microsoft, at Google, and at OpenAI, the big players in the US on these pieces that are going to say they are losing money on AI and it's hand over a fist. Like Microsoft, $30 a month for Copilot, it, it's $20 extra just a month of what they're losing on you if you're using it in a way. So I think that's something to consider is that this is still really early. The technology is the worst it's ever going to be today, yesterday, and tomorrow. It's moving at a rapid change, but there's no need to like just go ham and go as fast as possible. But also, if you're on that risk averse place, these incremental changes, this openness to trying and experimenting are there so that you aren't too late when it when we get to that place where these models and these use cases and these enterprise tools are in a better position to help you meet your clients' needs. Great point. I want to refer again to what Matt said, and I'll read to you what he's saying. He's saying, I'm trying to spread the word, but I'm being met with major resistance. And that works, again, in school districts, and that works in organizations. And the way to address this is to show a success on a specific use case. Take a use case that is not risky to the organization, whatever that may be. Develop it, show research. Here's what I've done. I've used it for three weeks in this scenario with this group of people to achieve this goal. Here's the results that we are seeing. Allow me to spread that. Now, it's not, oh, I want to use AI across the organization or across the school or across teaching. It's this use case or two use cases. If you pick the right use case, there's no reason people will say no. If you're getting 30, 40% benefits of efficiency on something that is not putting anything at risk, people will say yes. Once this is implemented and you got more people to buy in or interested, okay, now come up with two more use cases. And that's like the crack in the door where you, you can slowly open the door and get in and put it into more and more places in your organization. I want to go back to your framework. So we touched on two aspects of it. You said learn, and then you said define guidelines. What is the next step that you recommend to your organization that they would do? Yeah. So first of all, also like we, you're going to see more like organizations, especially if you're working in like you're doing RFPs or others that are look for those AI guidelines and always be clear that they're generative AI guidelines within an AI guideline po like policy. So specificity language, very important. So yeah. So define those guidelines and use, do those pieces. And then I think it's like time to start experimenting. And so like we talked about some use cases, but like this is like the time to actually you talked about skunk, like the idea of the geeks. What are your skunk work projects in which you could actually pull up some ideas about what this can really do? And I think this is something that gets really fascinating pretty quickly is that while I just talked about the expense of these tools, that's the expense of these tools at scale. The expense of these tools of even taking an instance on Microsoft Azure or another platform, like you can use you know, whatever your poison is, your Amazon, you're using Bedrock, whatever you want to use, right? And throw up something and build internal tools or build some stuff and start to play around because that's going to be the special stuff. And when I and I see that's not happening so much, and I and this idea that our imagination hasn't quite caught up yet with what the technology can do. And so I think that this is an opportunity to have some time. To, to have those people, like you built the base, right? People are now building their productivity. They're using it responsibly. But now what is the next version of your technology, your work? Because that is going to be 
in my mind, the defensible place to use generative AI or AI writ large. Because, and that is what it's missing right now. You've got a lot of big players that are focused on frontier models, right? The underpinning, right? But you have a lot of small players or individual players that are building these point solutions or these very, what do we need to do better today? But very few of them are thinking about what could we do for the spaceship world, like the crazy world that's coming. And I think that's an opportunity to do that and to activate that because that's going to be the difference because you're going to start to see like OpenAI is going to release a tool that is going to, like this has happened multiple times. It's going to take out entire categories of different types of companies. It's, hap it's happening. And a lot of these right now, are not just generative AI companies or AI companies. These are companies that like copywriting, graphic design, you see this happening. So if you guys, you, I would really highly suggest at that next stage, where are you investing in the experimentation, the innovation and creating space for that to happen? Because it's going to be an existential question pretty soon, especially in high knowledge, skilled worker type of places. The IMF put out a report that said about 40% of all jobs will be impacted by generative AI. But that is 70% in the U.S., 60% in the U.K., but 70% in the U.S. is the expectation. Great points. I think the first step for people who haven't played with it is you started with the basic, right? Have a prompt library that really gives some kind of a standard to people to start with. The second stage of that is you can create your own GPTs right now on OpenAI's platform. And for those of you who don't know what a GPT is, the problem with ChatGPT is that it's so broad, right? Oh, it can do anything because it can do anything. It's so overwhelming. You don't really know what to do. A GPT is like a mini version of ChatGPT that lives within ChatGPT, but it's a mini version of ChatGPT that's geared to do something very specific. If we'll take it to the school world, how do I write a math test for the first semester of fourth grade, right? You can create a GPT that will do that. You can create a GPT that helps you answer customer service emails. You can create a GPT that will help you create marketing content. You can create a GPT that will help you innovate and think about the next version of your product. Like, But each and every one of them is something you can do with people who are special with their specialty. And like you're saying, it brings the organization secret sauce, right? You can take documents, agendas, concepts, ideas, and bring this into those GPTs that now only your organization can use to gain a benefit that other people cannot use because you're taking the capability of the model, combining it with know-how that only your people have to create something that is unique to you that will allow you to excel beyond your competition. And it, I, it, like, if you think about GPT, there's a lot of different ways to do. There's GPT trainer and others like chat based. There are all kinds of playgrounds. It doesn't have to be with, it's actually probably the most expensive to use as a large organization, the enterprise solution from OpenAI. But if you use a GPT for teams with them, $25 a month, if you're paying for the yearly piece, you can create it. They data is not trained on. You can create your own GPTs that are shareable, but also they are like really unreliable. Everybody, if you create a GPT, I saw that Matt's creating it. If you're creating a GPT, it is so easy for me as someone else to have that GPT tell me all its training data, yeah. all its directions and its system prompt. So like these are not safe systems and just be aware of that. Again, I will always advocate for the outside of the experiment, like out of sight of the getting people involved Think about pulling these tools internally and finding your sandbox and going off of OpenAI and going into a Microsoft, like other places that can give you some security around not training your data, building solutions. You can also do it in whatever, if you have a very technically advanced team, throw up whatever sandbox you want to use and then use an API into the best models, right? So I'm still suggesting that. But there are also a lot of open source models that are improving every day. You've got Mistral and Mixtral, the model, the coming out, smaller language models as well, more point solutions that are the places to try. But the fascinating thing is that still today, even fine-tuned models like that are focused on a specific thing with good prompting, do not are not more are not better reliably than a GPT four with right. good prompting, yep. even without fine tuning. And so mm -hmm. there's something to be said too about like where are the places in which you have your internal people, maybe having them be able to continue to grow their ability to prompt and use these tools for the foreseeable future. But then if you're building something. Make sure, like I really highly suggest, it'll be cheaper for you and it will be safer for you if you're throwing up your own instance with APIs.
Correct. And to touch on two points that you mentioned as far as safety in these models. First of all, Hugging Face literally just this week announced that they have a GPT, like a GPT kind of solution. You can still not upload your own files to it and so on, but I'm sure that's coming as the next step. So over there, it's an open source. You can run it on your own servers. Nobody's training on the data. Nobody has access on the data. But as far as the GPT side, yes, it's very easy to quote unquote hack GPTs, but you don't have to publish them to the world. So you can just keep them within your team and then nobody else has access to them. So people within the organization can figure out how they work. So I always, I still think from a user friendliness perspective without a adva more advanced team or at least a few people in your organization that can figure out how to build a sandbox with an open source model and then run on top of that. The easiest thing, get a team's license for, for ChatGPT, have a few people have access to it, run your own GPTs only internally so nobody has access to it. If you're using the Teams model, they're not training on your data either. So it's a relatively safe starting point. I agree with you 100% that if you want to scale this to, oh, now I want every student in the district to use this, you probably want a different solution. But as an experimentation, easy, fast, quick, and dirty thing to see if this thing does what it needs to do, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Agreed. Yeah, I totally agree. Like path of least resistance as well. But I think that if we move towards that experimentation phase, like that's where I'd like, again, but I'm also very privacy minded. I'm very safety minded. I think that's just a thing like, like I was talking to a district, a large district yesterday about like safety and some of it's if you can try your best to teach people how to use these tools correctly, or you can create a sandbox and a place in which they can be used like ethically. And some of these cases, so I'm always going to err on that side, but I totally agree that the path of least resistance, the best way to get started to me is at foundational stage. A GPT Teams is a great place to do it. And 300 bucks a month for a group of a, like our size business, that's a no brainer. I agree hundred percent. Let's take a few examples. I'm just curious to see in your field, what do you see as far as innovative things that some of the people you're working with are doing with this within schools or companies and so on that are taking really the extra step beyond, oh, we figured out how to prompt this thing. Yeah, I, mean, I know the fascinating thing is that the innovation right now is not what I would call innovation. The innovation right now is adoption, but it's innovation because it's so new and so different. I don't see significant like moments where, and I don't think I'm alone on this. I spoke at Stanford last week and there were the closing with Sal Khan and Chris Rogash, who's a, a computer science professor. And they both said that we, I haven't seen anything that like has like really blown me away in terms of yeah. what will education become. And I think that we are not, we're not moonshotting right now. And so like true innovation I haven't seen as much, but I've seen interesting and more innovative adoption, which is where we start to see like real commitment to building knowledge, to identifying use cases, to creating spaces to work with students with disabilities in ways that, in, that have never happened before, to ways to truly differentiate and update content based on student need, skill level, and interests that like that are pretty basic. We're not talking go out and create 15 bots, but like, how do you take this one research guide and make 25 in the same amount of time it take you to make one? There's some really fascinating things here. And making it consistent, trying to drive like cohorts of people that get that space to learn and bring it back and then start to build those embedded practices. But what, and I think it's happening in pockets and some that are adopting and trying like New York City and LA, which are the two largest districts in the country are building essentially their own generative AI tools, like our sandboxes, instead of saying, let's open this up. And they're doing it in a way in which they're able to control. Like, this is one thing that's really interesting about this moment in time is that schools, for example, have always given away a lot of data, a lot of data in safe, hopefully safe ways. But this time where you don't have to give it away. Like you can create, if you have that much money behind you and you have that bitch buying power and you have some teams, like keep that data for yourself and build that knowledge of what it is. And I think that's really interesting. I think we're a little bit, like I think in education, we're still in that early adopter land so much that so much about it is just basic adoption, removing the stigma about use of these tools from students and potentially teachers and to create the space for that to happen. And that's where I see 
the majority of these early schools really in districts focusing on. And I know I'm saying that there are tons of people individually doing amazing things where they're having kids like submit prompts and learn how to prompt engineer and create, not go for an essay, but you now you create a whole business plan. There are some really beautiful opportunities, but they're happening in pockets and silos. And there hasn't yet been a cohesion of like best practice and or innovation. Yep. Yeah. I, I, and by the way, it's the same thing in organizations, right? You have people who are early adapters, like in businesses who are early adapters, who find ways to use it in the organization and but there's no coherent strategy on how to use it across a thing and in the school world it's even bigger right because it's not just okay we figured it out in the school then you have the county the district the state the federal there's so many other layers to the education system that needs to eventually preferably sooner than later figure it out if people like unless you have anything to add i want to let you share with people how they can work with you follow sure. you, learn more about this topic. But if you have anything to add, then start with that. Yeah, no, I think this is, I think that to everyone here, this is just a really unique opportunity to build and create like never before. And I think that the way I think about it is that you're limited right now by your creativity, your resilience, meaning like you don't always get what you want out of a bot and your ability to prompt right now is the limits of what you can do. As long as you're not trying to do fifth grade math, because these large English models are absolutely trash at math. But Horrible I think, <laughs> yes, and that this is going to be the move to the move towards like artificial general intelligence will be where we start to see like this reasoning, this math reasoning, and will be part of that process. But what I think is really cool, though, is this is, again, the limits are really the ones you put on yourself right now. And so if you're an organization and this is exciting and you're thinking about this, like there are opportunities to start to build this, this take this excitement and start to try to build it within your organization. We do a lot of work around like strategy and adoption. We do a lot of free webinars. I We have a women in AI and education group that Marta, who is here with us today, and the audience is a part of. We have a lot of ways to interact with us. I'm also super on LinkedIn. I think that's how I'm at. As, our, um, as a non-social media person, it's quite funny to be this on LinkedIn, but we find it a really great way to be able to share resources. And a lot of them are education, but there's so much more. I think we see that over and over again that the approaches that we're taking in the education field are ones in which if you took out education would work across any organization. So feel free to connect that way and just really appreciate the time and the ability to be with you all today and hope that you're enjoying your journey too and that it's helping you out on your own productivity and creativity. Amanda, thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. I think we we discussed a lot of topics that so many people are struggling with right now. And I, if I summarize the key points that we talked about, one is you want to experiment in a safe way. And as the leader of an organization, you want to create that sandbox that people can experiment in a safe way. Two, you want to start bringing in your own information into this, again, in a closed box, not risking it. So you can build stuff that is yours and that you can innovate. We touched on the point, if you're a quote unquote, a nobody, a small cog in a large machine, you can still be proactive and find specific use cases and through that grow within your organization. And in many cases, you may become the person that's in charge of that innovation, which will give you a very exciting new role that you can do. So there's, we touched on a lot of great points. We also touched on the world between closed companies like OpenAI and Microsoft, but also that just the whole open source universe that is incredible right now. And it's thriving and it's easy to use. You don't have to be like a crazy tech person to be able to use some of these tools. So lots and lots of great information. I really appreciate you joining and sharing with us today. Thank you. And hope everyone has a good day. Thank you so much. We appreciate it and enjoy your day. Bye.